Before we start, I just want to say to everybody that we're actually very, very happy that so many people have registered for this series of webinars. And we are very happy that you all joined us for the eighth uh, webinar, actually, which is also our last one. And we really hope you are enjoying them. We are getting really good comments through the evaluations. Uh, but uh, we would like to hear more opinions today and at the end of the session. And I would also like to tell you that this may be the last webinar, but uh, this is not our last activity. So um, you will find out today from uh, Professor Tomaselli what is our next activity, and he will be able to let us know whether you're interested in joining that one as well. So before uh, we start, as I said, this uh, webinar will also take the form of an interview as the last one did uh, between Mr. Peter Jenner and Professor Salvo Tomaselli. And uh, they will uh, introduce themselves to you. So with this, I would like now to give the floor to Professor Tomaselli. Thank you, Naya. Thank you all for being here and thank you, Peter, for uh, accepting to share with me this session. Uh, well, we are here for the last uh, webinar of the series uh, for the spring project. As we already mentioned uh, in, other, in other cases, the spring project uh, has been funded by the Erasmus Plus program and uh, has created a team of academics and consultants who combine their knowledge and expertise uh, to create models for delivering uh, succession successfully, uh, hopefully for family businesses. And uh, today we are going to explore the uh, spring framework for succession with the help uh, of, of Peter's uh, insights and reflections and why each domain is important uh, and uh, the leadership challenges and uh, how the process for succession should be afforded uh, within family businesses. Uh, we will also explore the advantages of integrating uh, the, the framework from, for succession into the uh, broader framework of the future directions uh, of, of the business. Uh, before we start, uh, uh, as Naya was mentioning, uh, I, I just give you a few informations about how we will handle the session. It will be in the format of uh, a dialogue between Peter and myself on certain uh, issues. And uh, as we did the last time, we will also propose you some self reflection questions. And uh, uh, Naya, can you kindly tell people what they should be prepared for doing uh, in respect to the self-assessment? Yes, so the self-assessments are designed uh, via a platform called menti.com. Uh, so we have, I've sent you the links via the chat window. So in there, you can already open the two self-assessment tests that we have for today. So you can prepare when asked to actually vote. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, well, uh, Peter Jenner is a uh, alumnus of the US Government International Leaders Program. He, has a char he is a chartered engineer at AMSC Thesis Self-Learning Remote Control System. He is author of four UK government guides for business associated with sustainability and, and profit. He is author of six EU-funded business guides on a range of topics related to innovation through engaging uh, uh, the workforce. He has also created an internationally accredited 12th unit program and qualification of the topic for leadership and sustainability. Finally, he, is, he has 25 years of making mistakes as he says about himself in succession, linked to business growth and transformation programs. And uh, last but not least, I'm proud 
to be working with him and to be called one of his friends. So let's, let's start, Peter, uh, with uh, this conversation. And uh, I kindly ask uh, all the participants to ask questions uh, through, the, uh, through the chat during the session. We will give space uh, at the end of the session for uh, a, a question and answer uh, session that will be longer than uh, the one we had last time. And uh, I also uh, propose that we can have an, a, one additional session in one day that we will uh, notify later on. Uh, that will be eventually in the form of, the, of a panel between uh, the members uh, of involving uh, various members of our partnership uh, to address eventually additional questions that have not emerged during the, the previous webinars or even uh, some uh, relevant question that has been asked in the question and answers uh, and that's not been uh, uh, answered because of time constraints uh, in in the uh, during the session. So be prepared for that. Stay tuned because we will announce this. And also, as we already announced uh, on, uh, on the last webinar, we will have a, a learning network uh, uh, event, or eventually uh, more than one session on this trying to build a group conversation on the topic around which the spring project has developed. So now, Peter, let's start. Thank you once again for being with us. And uh, uh, let's speak about this third leadership challenge. And my uh, first question is why and how? Did you become interested in, uh, in succession family businesses? And uh, why do you call this the third leadership challenge for family businesses? Okay, well, I came at this subject from a, a rather unusual angle. Um, I've been interested all my professional life in sustainability. That is economic, social, and environmental sustainability together. That's why I had the American Leadership Program. Um, and when I was in the States and when I attended a conference in Stuttgart on succession planning, I suddenly realized that there's a great opportunity. I mean, succession in family business is a threat. We said last week that the EU loses 500,000 businesses, UK 100,000 businesses each and every year before the pandemic. And I think that's a terrible waste. So that's the threat. The flip side is the opportunity that at the point of succession, we can look at how we can regenerate family businesses and make them thrive and survive and thrive and go on to the future. And when I talked about um, succession planning being the third leadership challenge, to me, in my mind, the first leadership challenge is innovation and entrepreneurship and hard work. That is creating a family business from nothing. I mean, starting out and the, I'm in awe of people who do that because of the hard work they put in and taking ideas and putting them into action and their tenacity and their sleepless nights. And so that's the first leadership challenge. To me, the second one is to take that uh, embryo business and to create the structures and systems and the management structures for a healthy and thriving business. So there are various stages of growth. So that's the second leadership challenge. And I've said the third leadership challenge is succession in the sense that it's, they're all different challenges, but the succession one is quite hard because it's like passing over your baby. It's saying that I, you know, I've inherited a business or I've created a business and I do I have competence, confidence in the competence of the people that I'm gonna pass this over to members of my family or others. And so that's why I called it the third leadership challenge. And um, when I've done succession in family businesses, which I have for 25 years or thereabouts, I've never called it a succession plan. And the reason for that is the green eyed monster in the sense that I've had a chat with the chairman of the company or the CEO or the owner, and we've discussed the need for succession planning, but I've said, well, let's not call it that because it sends out all the wrong messages. Let's talk it about survival and high growth. 
And let's talk about a high growth program. And as we go through this program, which will hopefully uh, increase the profitability of the company dramatically and the turnover, um, we will create the room for succession to grow. And we'll create all the systems for succession as we're doing that. So that's the way that I've taken it. Um, and the idea is to prepare the business for succession, for successors and succession, and to prepare the successors to assume roles within the business. Um, and confidentiality is quite, well, it's very important in this issue because I remember one Welsh rugby player, a famous guy who had a business and I was doing a succession program for him. And he said, if you tell anybody you're doing this for me, I will kill you. So I said to him, take a number, join the queue. It's all the way around the block of people who want to kill me. So um, that's the, the reason that I think this third leadership challenge is important and why I think Coupled with this and the handbook that you and I've written, it'll take us with confidence into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And then my, my next question is, uh, why do you refer to succession planning in family businesses as unpicking the onion? Well, <laughs> the, the unpicking the onion thing is, is, um, is an interesting issue in the sense that um, when you say, I'd rather use the analogy of a pebble in a pond, yeah. uh, which is what Naya's put up now. And I, I'd like you all, from now on in, when somebody talks about succession, I'd like you to think of this one image, the pebble in the pond. If you drop a pebble in the pond, you create concentric circles. So that's enough, Naya. We can take that off if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. So when, I'm picking the onion. I, I sometimes use that analogy because it's... It, uh, when you unpick an onion, it has lots of different layers and makes you cry. So that can be something about succession. But the pebble in the pond is interesting, I think, because if we take this analogy, we can take what is a very complex subject and make it simple and accessible. If you think of the pebble in the pond, you've got these concentric circles that go around. Now, the first circle, and there are five of them that I want us to consider today, the first circle is about values, what this business is based on, the legacy of the business and the founders and the aspirations. So in other words, that's about um, the, the core of what we're about. So the first shell we have to sort out is the legacy, the um, values and the aspirations. The second one, which is what Salvo alluded, alluded to last week, is the shell about strategy. Now strategy is extremely important because I'll come on to that later on in one of the other comments that I'm going to make, but we need a very good strategy and most strategies are not good by the way, 70% fail. So we want good strategy so that we have a, a way of getting the business from where it is now to where it wants to be as a context for succession and for high growth. The third shell is about selecting and developing worthy successes. And that's really important because these are the people that will take the business through the rest of the century or to the next generation. So we want to select the right people for the right place and the jobs, which I'll also cover later on. And then the next level is governance. And I've learned a lot from Salvo about governance because this he's an expert in the field and we always learn from each other. But there are two sides to governance. Governance is how we run the business. Um, governance in terms of running the business, i.e. the board or the senior management team focusing on strategy and the performance management team, as I call it, uh, focusing on operational issues, so the management issues. And then the family side, how do we manage the aspirations and the, the concerns of the family and how does the family influence the strategy and the nexus between the two, how we link this governance structure to make the business and the family one, which is extremely important in a family business and failure in that causes lots of problems, as Salvo alluded to last week. And the last level that we will discuss is the action plan, because without an action plan, we're just having a chat with no result. The point about the shared learning network that Salvo alluded to and the handbook for family business that we've designed together is to give you a tool to take you from where you are now, wherever that is, to where you need to be with regard to succession. There's one other area that I want to mention, which we do not cover in the handbook or on these topics, and that is the legal tax and financial frameworks. Now, every country 
um, needs has its own frameworks. In the UK, I'm not competent to talk about that, but I know people who are very good experts on legal issues, tax issues, and financial issues. And th there's not a lot of them around, but we need good people. But we shouldn't consider legal tax financial issues now. We should consider those after we've designed our succession strategy. To do it too soon is not a good thing. And our legacy at the end of it all is twofold, I think. Love within the family. And it's interesting that we talk about love in the context of business, but this is a family business. So our legacy as owners are love within the family and a healthy, successful business to pass over. Thank you, Peter. Really, uh, well, I, I totally agree with you about these different levels of thinking. Uh, and uh, this brings us to go a bit more in depth on uh, living values. Uh, why are they important? And what do you mean by living values? Now, it's, it's unusual. Like, you know, Salvo said, I'm an engineer. And you think, well, why on earth would an engineer and a business person be concerned about values? Well, we all learn by our mistakes. And I, and I, and I would say that in the 21st century, we need to engage all the people in our business and all in the same direction. I mean, the, the problem is in lots of businesses is a lack of alignment. In other words, if I'm at the front line, I don't know through various lack of communication what is expected of me. But the values of a business are really important because they create behaviors. I mean, I'll give you one. Um, one value that we have in my business is that we treat everyone with respect. Now, you could say, well, that's just a statement. But actually, what it means in practice is that we treat everybody with respect, irrespective of their status. So if they're the car park attendant or the secretary or the salesperson or the delivery driver or the CEO or the management team, we treat them all with respect. And you may say, well, you know, what's that? I, to me, in my experience, it's everything. Because when we come to a succession program, which is about applied learning and about getting the best from everybody, I, I wrote a guide once on innovation and drew a, a pyramid and I draw the top of the pyramid of 15% of the brains that we engage, which are the managing director, the management team, the family, the board. But we don't engage all of the rest of the, of the brains. And that is a big mistake. So values are about how we behave. They're about how we treat people and how we engage all of our people. And, and Salvo last lecture talked about us needing a compass and our destiny and our destination. And all of these are very important because either we become masters of our destiny or we become victims to what happens to us. But what I'm saying on the good ship, the business we have, we need a rudder. And that rudder is the other values that we live by. Um, and as a result, they give us competitive advantage. Now, in, to me, there are four sets of values. And every, every company would need to decide what they are. And I've just talked about respect, but there are four sets. The first one is care more. And this is relevant. Please don't think this is not relevant to succession planning because it's how we treat each other within the family, within the business. And these are very important for me, answering a lot of the questions that came up in the chat last week. So first one is care more. And that means uh, we care for us, uh, each other. We care for the, the staff. And the overwhelming majority of family businesses led by people who care about their staff and are having sleepless nights right now because of the pandemic and paying them. But care more means that if you care for your staff, they will care for the customer. If you don't care about your staff, who do they take it out on? The customer. So care more is about that. And in 3M in Minneapolis and St. Paul, they care about their customers and they live with their customers. And that is the father of lots of innovation that they come up with in terms of developing new products and services. So the first field is care more. The second one, which I wrote a government guide on for the UK is simplify. In other words, looking at waste and non-value adding in companies, which is 40% of turnover, by the way, it's a lot of money. So we simplify what we do and we make sure that processes are fit for purpose. And we ask two questions. Why do we do it this way? Why do we do it at all? Both quite profound statements. The third area is can do. 
Now that's a very interesting point. Can do is about getting something solved. I've had several management team meetings where people will come to the meeting with a load of problems without solutions. So I will say to them, are you in the right room? Should you be in this room? I mean, this is the this is the leadership team. And leaders are expected to not only bring problems, but bring solutions. So it's inappropriate for you to come to this meeting without having thought of solutions to your problems. And if you can't, and that's really great, we'll discuss it. But it's not a leadership behavior to have a not a can-do attitude. A can-do attitude for successes, and all of these things are vital, by the way. And the last quadrant on values is legacy. And legacy can be simply said as, we leave things better than we found them in the small things and the great things. And that's what we're discussing anyway. And so I'll mention one company and two of their values were funny. They were quirky and bonkers. This was a, a, a mill that when I first met them, they were discussing uh, growth and succession. I said, are you special? And they said, no, not really. But when I got to know them, they would covered a plane with fabric a Boeing 747 with fabric and then take that off and sold it for an AIDS charity. And they made all the fabric for Prince Charles, house, Prince Charles's house. So they were special, but they were quirky. In other words, they were unusual. They were not run of the mill and they were bonkers in the sense that they were sometimes did things that were not logical. At the end of the program, which was a succession and high growth program, they tripled their profits, doubled their turnover, sorted out their succession, and they were still quirky and they were still bonkers. So the point about it, values are that we can change everything in our lives, but our values, and that's true about companies. Thank you, thank you, Peter. And uh, well, now it's the moment for the first self-assessment uh, on values, aspirations, and uh, legacy. Uh, so the self-assessment has been signed by, by Peter to uh, offer self-reflection about a number of, uh, of topics. So I kindly invite you to answer uh, sincerely uh, to the question, to ask yourself about those questions. And uh, uh, because they, need, they, they are useful, first of all, to yourself for self-assessing your situation uh, in respect to your family business uh, and the succession process. Uh, Naya, is, uh, thank you for sharing the, uh, the framework of the self-assessment. So now you can go to the platform and uh, answer those questions. Uh, yes. Salvo says, we need to tell it like it is. I mean, you score yourself on the first one. I've ensured the precious values of the culture and the values are, are what we want. It's gone off the screen right now. So <laughs> just we just want to be as honest yeah. as we can on the answers. Yeah. Can you see them now, Peter? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes, thanks. I'm going to set two minutes on the clock as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It looks to me as though we've got everything to play for in this domain, haven't we? We've got, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the point about the self-assessment is to say that we need to resolve these issues. All of these questions are there to provoke us into thinking that we need to resolve them. And that's good. Okay. Okay. I think that's the end of the, the voting, Peter. Okay. Would you like to comment on the scores? Um, all, I, all I would say about this is we're, we're doing this collectively. So as a team together, we're saying where we think we are. Uh, as I have alluded to last week, sometimes when we do the same assessment with the next generation, sometimes the scorings are quite dramatically different. But in this case, it would say that, um, the values bring a strong culture, so that's quite good, actually, three. Um, and I, I would expect that from family businesses because we are about values uh, and we are about a strong culture and passing and caring about things. Um, we're not perhaps ready for a structured... This is the point about, as Salvo mentioned in his talk, that a sudden change in circumstances, a, a very dear friend of mine died of a heart attack last week. So I was reminded how what fragile little creatures we are, and perhaps the duty of succession, that's the second one. The shareholding is, is another big issue, which I will allude to when we discuss later on about how we um, can allocate shares. Um, un under the guide that Salva and I have written, we've got one chapter called um, Don't Give It to the Children, um, which isn't as bad as it sounds, incidentally, but it makes you want to read it. Um, yeah, and, and delegating operal responsibility is another big issue, because have we started doing that? And the time frame. So, I mean, I, I would say, looking at that, Maya, that it shows that we have work to do in this area. Would everybody agree with that? I, and that's all we're trying to do at this stage is to say, where are we now? You know, and uh, it looks to me that where we are is we have some work to do, which is cool. That's why we're actually sharing ideas with each other. I have any, any more, no more comments now on that. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, and uh, I want also to uh, remember to the participants that uh, the issues we are dealing with are also explored in the modules that will be available in over the platform. And you can refer to the individual modules of our program uh, to eventually uh, solve some doubts or uh, go more in depth on, on some topics that have been dealt with uh, eventually in a less deeper way during uh, all the webinars. So this is another important resources that we will be at, at, at the end of all the users of the spring project. Well, now let's follow with our, uh, with our reflection. Uh, and uh, sometimes you speak about the five rights in the family business and in the, 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 the selection and development of successors. What do you mean by the five rights? Do you mean that I am entitled to five rights? I'm entitled to first right, second right, third right, fourth right, and five right as a family member or as a shareholding owner. Can we put the slide up, Anaya, please? Is she there or not? Has Naya gone, is she? Okay. Um, right, well. Of course I'm the, here, never, Peter. <laughs> okay, have you got the slide? Yes, yes. Okay, so. Um, the five rights that I allude to are about choosing worthy successors. Um, and I think what we want is the right person, the right people and the right, with the right skills, with the right attitude, in the right place, at the right time. Um, thanks, Naya, we can take that off now. But I, I um, so that's what I mean by the five rights. But in reality, that's the ideal. And the question is, given real life situations, bearing in mind where we are now, and sometimes things happen unexpectedly, how do we uh, create a framework so that we can have those five rights? Um, 
So I, I think the answer, I, are we got the brand expert thing in the center now, or is it me in the center? It looks like it we, we've got- It should be you in the center. If people have their speaker view on, this, the person right. who well, speaks it's should okay. be in the center. Long, it doesn't matter. I don't really want to look at myself. It's depressing. So um, all I want to do is to have, <laughs> we need to have what I term a wide and a deep talent pool. In other words, um, and we've discussed this with Jesus from the EFB, that when we're talking about succession in family businesses, in my opinion, uh, bearing in mind that I've said that we want to talk about it as a, a structure whereby people will self-identify as successors, what we really need to have, in my opinion, is an op give successors an opportunity to actually prove themselves. So we have a wide talent pool. In other words, we don't exclude people uh, because they're not in the family or because they are in the family. I mean, they, one of the questions we had in the chat was, and I've had both situations where parents can favor children and put them in circumstances where they haven't got the necessary skills to deliver. But I've also had the converse where parents have not favored children. They've gone out of their way to disfavor their children, not to show favoritism. So I think the best thing to do is to work on a situation where we can have, um, give people a chance to be all they can be. So we have a wide and a deep talent pool. In other words, give, we are talking about a strategy for the future. We're talking about how are we gonna deliver that strategy? Well, we deliver that strategy by giving successes within the family and outside the family, an opportunity to deliver part of that strategy and to prove themselves. Um, but the issue to me is, that we need to have metrics of performance, which is important and another subject in itself. And something that I feel strongly about, which is that we should create a meritocracy. Now, it's a very big word, but what we're saying is that people who get promoted, it should be obvious that they've been promoted because of their merit. Now, you know, we can have an argument about that and I'm sure we will, but people who are promoted on merit have more self-confidence, they have more respect in the workforce, and they actually assure the future of the company. So it's very important to my mind that when we deliver the growth strategy, we involve the successors, we give them an opportunity, we give them personal accountability, and we help them. I mean, that's another big issue to my mind. If we are talking about a wider deep talent pool, I'm talking about the fact that leadership can't be taught, but it can be learnt, which is what Steve Covey said in his Eighth Habit book, but I believe it and I've seen it anyway. I think that if we're going to create leaders for the next generation, the best thing to do is to give them an opportunity to learn leadership and do that in practice. Now, they can do an MBA as in parallel with that, which will give them loads of other skills, but if they can bring back those skills and apply them in the context of the strategy, then they can build confidence and they can learn leadership in practice, learning through doing, but or and. And I think this is a very important thing. When we have children, I think we want them to succeed. And I think as leaders, current leaders, we want to do everything we can to make sure that there's enough support and mentoring and advice so that they can succeed. When I've driven uh, succession programs to high growth and I've behaved as a non-exec director I've always had people in the management team with tasks and if I said if you're stuck give me a ring and then we'll signpost them to other mentors or myself and I will meet them and discuss with them and help them and when they come back and report that they've done but it builds their self-confidence and sends a message right throughout the company that anybody can progress and that we are working on merit and we're giving them a chance to succeed and the other interesting thing I think about creating the context of growth with succession is that we're building headroom. Without headroom, what we're saying is, and when we're waiting for a person to die or retire to, before we have another job, when we've got a growth strategy and we're creating headroom, then people can see that they can progress. This, this is a, quite a dangerous thing, actually. I've talked to you about the, in the past that we should, you know, in my opinion, we don't talk about succession, we talk about growth. I had a situation where 
two very successful business people, partners, actually not family business partners, um, they decided that they wanted to retire. They told their two foremen that they would like to retire and they'd like to sell the business to them. Um, the, both those foremen were shocked and frightened and left and got other jobs. Then they approached me and said that we need to look at succession because we don't know what we're going to do. So I am saying there are lots of situations where it is better to talk about growth and let people prove themselves in succession and then give them the headroom when the business is growing to fill the jobs that they feel happy and confident in doing. So that's what I think the five rights are. In so doing, by creating an applied learning structure, giving them a chance to succeed and having a meritocracy, which is another subject and how to create that. But once you've got that, then you can find, they can prove that they are the right person. They do have the right skills. They are in the right place. They are there with the right time. And quite frankly, they wouldn't deliver the results that we need without the right attitude. So that's what I mean by that, So, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Peter. And uh, really, this, this is uh, quite profound uh, and it's different from uh, sometimes I've seen in family businesses intending uh, rights uh, as uh, entitlement, as I was joking at the beginning. So thinking about the four rights, the way you, uh, you try to invite people to do is really, is really inspiring in my view. And uh, can now, uh, Naya, can we now go to the, uh, to the next slide for the self-assessment on selecting and developing successors? Yes, uh, this is the next self-assessment. I shared the link also in Thank the you. chat just now. Would you like to go through the statements or shall we see the results? Yeah, well, we can go through them. And uh, Peter, can you? Yeah, maybe I mean, I, all, all I wanted to say is that the, the, the questions are structured to provoke us into thinking about our personal situation and to see whether that's relevant and whether we are, you know, whether we agree with the statement and that we're, we've virtually done it and we're a four or we're a zero or a one. And don't be afraid of zero ones. I mean, I've had lots of people putting in zero ones as scores, which is great because if we know where we are, we can get further. But the BAM family business uses a rigorous and structured assessment of successes, which is directly linked to the vital and current future skills needs, and where operational excellence uh, and the need to implement future strategy is considered. Now, you've got to have a good strategy for that, for, for starters. Then you've got to look at the skills to deliver the strategy, and then we select successes. There are three domains to that one question. So if you go through all of those and apply them to your business, and then score what you think is relevant. And yes, Naya, we could probably go on to the scoring thing now. Thank you, Peter. So I'll do the same again. Now we will be seeing the results in real time, and I will set the countdown to three minutes. How many people have voted, Naya? There's 15 people who voted so far. Okay. And there's about 45 seconds left. Okay. okay. People are still voting, actually. I can see that. That's okay. Um, well, that's cool.
Okay, Peter, so we have 18 responses in total. Okay, okay. So the, um, you know, the issue on this, of course, is that um, the score, the top score is four. So we're two out of four for the uh, rigorous self-assessment. We are over that 2.4. Um, to identify key people from within the company based on merit. Um, and on the third one, potential successes of a, a rigorous assessment, we've got 1.9 out of four. Um, and a comprehensive successor development programs in place, we have we are much lower than that 1.5. And we've got a situation more than uh, 2.4 out of four um, of successes being developed outside the company. Now, I'm a great believer in um, giving uh, the next generation an opportunity to get, get experience outside the company because they can see other cultures and other ideas. And that includes uh, MBAs and other courses and so on. And then being able to bring that back and use it within the company. But the issue is sometimes there is um, a dynamic where um, the company is not prepared to accept new ideas. So it's always good to have a context of strategy for growth because then Hopefully, we're open to new ideas for innovation. But that's interesting scoring, Naya. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I'll take it down. OK. There are some uh, interesting uh, reflections in the, in the chat about uh, values uh, communicated. Uh, Fedra is saying that values communicated within the company especially highlighted during uh, an orientation program for new recruits based on company's history should be aligned with business goals and future orientation within the organization and outside how we behave and treat people while considering how we would like to be treated. And, and this is especially true because uh, in my experience, if on the one, on, on the one hand, Having external experience is really uh, relevant uh, to uh, get open mind uh, to the success succeeding generation. It is also important in somehow to build a link with the company's and family's culture. And uh, it is important that, that you are able to balance in somehow these, these two aspects. So let's, uh, let's continue our journey. And uh, my uh, last question is, uh, you often refer to the term succession strategy ladders. Uh, what do you mean by this term? And what is the process for designing uh, a succession strategy for family businesses? I. I... You can see that uh, I'm a sort of person who thinks in, in uh, pictures. So um, there are a lot of wonderful works that have been written on strategy and Salvo discussed it last week, but I'm a simple sort of so. I learned this approach from 3M in Minneapolis and St. Paul where they, they run their company, their whole business and their regional uh, production facilities and their innovation based on what is virtually an action chart, a ladder really. <clears throat> and if you think about strategy as being a ladder, what do you need to have for a good strategy? You need to have, first of all, a good foundation. You don't put your ladder on sand, you put it on, on the rock. You know, you, as the Bible says about the house on the rock or the house on sand. So the strategy has got to be on a good foundation. And that foundation is based upon, in this case, as we've used, on our our perceptions of where we think the business is now with regard to our self-assessments. And, and we always enlarge that by, um, when I've done a self-assessment with a business owner, then we have a discussion on this and we do, as I say, a high growth program, but they then do a, a similar self-assessment for the company, uh, but this one is entitled high growth. And it's quite incredible the difference of opinion within the same company on the same questions, depending on where you are in the management structure and on the generational issues. So um, the self-assessment is basically a way of creating a strong shared foundation of where we all believe that we are now. In the sense that when we just show the scoring, 
we have, uh, which we will publish shortly, um, a matrix. So you have the self-assessment and then you will see there is a difference between where you think you are now and where you want to be. If you want to be a level four and you're currently at level one, you know you've got three quadrants to actually go. So um, the point about the strategy ladder is that we have the firm foundation. The second thing is, Salvo in last week's presentation talked about our destiny and destination. If you think about strategy as a ladder within a room, you can't put your ladder on four walls. You put your ladder against one wall. Now, that's quite interesting because the ladder against one wall means we decide not only what we're going to do, but we're deciding what we're not going to do. <clears throat> I've seen lots of organizations um, in the public and private sectors where the strategy is quite woolly in the sense that I've been given a strategy document, which is beautifully bound and presented in great color and detail, but it doesn't say, number one, exactly where we want to go, but more importantly, how we're going to get there. So the first thing, if you think about the ladder, it's what is the firm foundation? Are we Have we got a firm foundation? Um, and I say, incidentally, we need to measure where we are now. And I, I upset people sometimes by saying, well, there are very few companies I've worked with that know where they are now. And you can get upset about that, but it's really saying we need to measure the right things. Um, what we measure is what we get. And if we measure the right things, we will understand where we are now. And it's a platform to growing where we want to be in the future. The second thing is the other end of the ladder. Where do we want to be by when? What are we going to be really good at? And what is our ambition? But bearing in mind, it is the other three walls we are not chasing. So if we've got an opportunity in the other areas, then we don't chase that. So we decide which ladder we're going to put our wall against. So when I talk about a good succession strategy ladder, to me, there are seven rungs. The first one is establish a sense of urgency. Now, we all know that, I think we all agree, the succession is important. It's important because uh, without it, we can have the wrong person taking over in the wrong job with the wrong skills at the wrong time. And we have 500,000 businesses, family businesses in the EU failing due to lack of succession planning, another 100,000 in the UK. And so is it important to have a succession strategy? Yes. But is it urgent? Well, not really. I mean, I've got to make sure the business can survive the pandemic and then thrive in the future. But or and what I'm trying to say in this presentation is that we should design our strategy for the future. And at the same time with that strategy, we create our structures for succession so that we can do two things at the same time. And in so doing, we don't have to focus on alienating people by talking about succession. We're talking about the survival of the business and how it will thrive. And by the way, we're putting in structures to identify the right successes. So the first thing is establish a sense of urgency. And it is important. The second thing is what I've already alluded to, knowing where you are now. Now, knowing where you are now is partly uh, the self-assessment because that gives us a very good, a quick idea of where we possibly are now. And hopefully, because we're engaging other people from the family and other managers, it's a shared measurement of where we are now. Um, I have alluded to the fact that eventually we do need to have a performance regime which measures in lots of areas where we currently are. The third step, which I think is really important, is to form a, gui a guiding coalition. In other words, you can't drive succession on your own. You have to drive succession by engaging with key people. And I think about, I have alluded to this earlier on. I mean, I, you know, I did allude to the fact that the chairman of this company wanted to have a, a town hall meeting to announce to his 100 employees that we're talking about succession and high growth. Well, I did have to say, hold on a second. We haven't sorted out a strategy. We haven't gotten the objectives. We haven't decided how we're going to deploy it. Um, so wouldn't it be really good if we postponed that until we had a plan and then we announced the plan 
at a town hall meeting and then we ask people to buy in and accept roles and responsibilities but in addition to holding back on saying what we're doing to everybody we do need to have a guiding coalition of people within the family and senior people within the company those who we can trust this is an important thing i guess that we need to have people that we can trust to actually get together form this guiding coalition and know that we're looking at succession planning but actually talk about it in the context of growth and not create all the problems of infighting that we do but if we can find about four or five people that we can trust to work together then that's forming the guiding coalition the next step the fourth step is what i've alluded to at the top of the ladder we want to have an inspiring vision of the future we want a vision which is in 3D and bright color. In other words, we want to know what we're going to do with the family business in the future. What are we going to do? How successful are we going to be? Are we going to grow within our locality, within our region? Are we going to go internationally? Um, and, and I know right, that we've got to recover from the pandemic. I'm not saying that we haven't. Incidentally, Salvo and I wrote a joint paper which was published in the United States on 10 steps to recovery within the pandemic. And if you want to have a copy of that, we're happy to share that sample, I guess, aren't we? Um, yes, we are. And, and, and that, like the handbook that we've alluded to, uh, does, does say some very blunt things. But I think that we want to look at survival from the pandemic, but we need to have a vision of the future that encourages our people to think that we have got a future, that we're all working in this together, and we're all sharing the responsibility to take the company to where it's going to go. When we've done all of that, when we've done all of that, and not before, can we work on selecting and developing successors? Because we're saying that we're asking the successors to work within the context of the strategy to actually get us from where we are now to where we want to be we're empowering them and there's an awful lot of talk about empowerment and i'm a great believer in empowerment but i do think that we need a framework for empowerment before we do have the empowerment itself in other words we need to have the right structures in place so that people can succeed but more than that that we can measure their performance and how they're doing but if we empower them and if we support them and if they can do applied learning and if we have a talent pool in the context of where the business is going on our strategy ladder then we have a very good chance a very good chance of making sure that our growth plan works and our succession plan works and the last step step number seven is you know pouring concrete and creating structure in other words we consolidate succession when we've had progress when we've saved the company when it's growing when people have realized their capabilities and we've given them a chance to learn and we've supported them and they've succeeded and we've got metrics of success then and only then can we do appraisals performance appraisals and that performance appraisal then is based upon real life situation real life achievement real life learning gaps and then from that we can have a transparency in terms of career progression and merit. So I think that's all good. And then when we've got all this success, we have the ownership structure sorted out because we can see then who will be worthy owners and who might not be. And then we can put governance structures in place. Um, and then once we've done that, I think we've satisfied the whole third leadership challenge of succession and we have confidence in the future. So. Um, that's my plan. So that's what I, that's what I think. Thank you, Peter. Uh, there is one uh, one question by Peter May, who asks, "Can you kindly repeat step number six? Because she missed it." Oh, I'm sorry. Sec I, the, I, I have told Salvo that he tells me, you know, she told me, "Long to more or lang some." In other words, slow down. So um, <laughs> that is my problem. I do talk too quickly, so I apologize for that. Um, stack number six is selecting and developing successes. And I've said that when you want to, um, what I've said primarily is that I don't believe, I don't, I have not seen over the last 20 years of experience that we can select and develop successes without a context. I mean, the, the danger, you know, the reality is that 
I think parents are not that well suited to select successors. I think um, it is quite nice to have an independent opinion. And quite frankly, I've often been blamed by both generations for what, you know, for the succession process. It's nice to have someone to blame so that, you know, um, the successor, if, if she or he um, wants to succeed or wants to go and work in the company, then we need to work with them to do that. But sometimes they don't want to work in the company and it's nice to create a bridge for them to re realize what they want to do. So we select and develop successors by creating an opportunity for them to prove themselves. How? By delivering one of the rungs of the ladder on the strategy. So say, for instance, we are saying that we're going to reduce uh, non-value adding waste within the company by, what should we say, a target of £100,000 uh, within 12 months. Now, that's a smart target. So we are saying to that person, we want to save hundred grand within 12 months by taking out non-value adding. So that person then goes away and creates a project and their own team and their own ladder to deliver that project. And in so doing, with the support, with the mentoring, they prove their capability, which at the end of the year, when they have their appraisal, together with all the people in the talent pool who are working together and supporting each other, can then um, prove that they're worthy successors in terms of leadership and in terms of ownership, possibly. Thank you, Vidir, but sometimes it happens that it doesn't emerge one single successor who can be the, the future leader of the company. But you have instead a group, a team of talented people. Yeah. And uh, it is really hard in some cases to choose among them or even, uh, especially with the younger generation, it's going to be more difficult that they tend to accept reciprocally the others leave the leadership on themselves. I mean, the, the, the question frequently uh, people from younger generation asks me is, why should I accept my brother being my boss or my cousin being my boss? Uh, <clears throat> in the past, these issues were solved by age people accepted uh, age order as a way for, uh, for choosing. You are older and then you are the first. Nowadays, uh, it seems like uh, people doesn't accept this kind of, of ways for selecting people. So what would you suggest in a case you have a, a, a really, you have prepared a really good team of people a good team of next generation family members. And uh, uh, it is hard to establish one single leader in the team. I, I think, yeah, sorry, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Salvo, in terms of everything I've said about the strategy being implemented by the next generation is that everybody within the family and without the family works together as a team to deliver the strategy. and. And they support each other. The interesting thing is that each team, each lead has a team which may comprise members from other uh, areas as well. So we're all supporting each other. And I, I remember speaking to a, a managing director of a family company once and I asked him, what, you know, what do you bring to the party? And he said, well, actually, I don't actually do anything. I mean, I just here as a figurehead. And after I worked with the company for about nine months, I said, you know what? You're the glue that holds it all together. So there is a point about the role of the leader. In the 21st century, you know, you can have a dictator and I, you know, we've had uh, dictatorial leadership and in business, sometimes it works, but I don't necessarily work with businesses like that that run through uh, fear because I think that this leader, Nigel was a great leader because he brought out the best from people. He made sure that when we had a meeting Every meeting had purpose and outcome, which is a very big deal because most meetings don't have purpose and outcome and people wonder why on earth they've been there. He gave everybody a chance to speak. We focused on solving problems collectively. And in actual fact, he was a leader, but he wasn't, he was almost a covert leader. You know, he brought things out of, out of meetings. We discussed what we were doing and we created a structure where 
people were expected to deliver on their promises. If they promised to do something, then they would do it. And quite frankly, a lot of people were happier than that. Sometimes people don't want the worry and the responsibility of the, the ultimate leadership. But I agree, um, you know, the, the way that I've run these programs is we've got to work with who we've got and we've got to make sure that um, people can give their best, but also that they're supported by each other. Um, but Arnaud has submitted a very good question as well, Salvo. Have you seen that? Salvo, we can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted, Salvo, I think. I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying there is a, a, an interesting question by Arnaud Flem about the businesses which grow so slower than the family, so that sometimes there is not enough space for multiple family members in the business. And uh, how do you think this kind of situations uh, should be dealt with? It's not an unusual situation, is it, where I've talked about high growth and, and like, you know, I have worked with lots of companies that have really gone through high growth. Um, incidentally, I will say something. When we had a meeting with the German Chamber of Commerce in Berlin, they said they needed eight years to do succession um, within, a, within a company, right? I have done it within 24 months, but it has to be intense and they have to go through the program and quite frankly it's quite scary in terms of the progress we're doing high growth and succession but in some of those instances like now quite frankly Arnold's question is very relevant i mean at the moment we're talking about survival leave alone growth the the question i, I guess on that again is um we can't all be leaders but i think people should prove themselves and, and I think that we, and, and, and I've seen, you know, a friend of mine, she owned several hotels and a fantastic leader because when the cleaners didn't come in, she would do the cleaning jobs. And I, and I think that leadership um, is not about telling people to do stuff. It's about doing it yourself. So I think that in a family where there are lots of uh, members working together, then I think you have to um, share the roles and I, I believe that people will self-select, but, but there is a point as well that sometimes people don't want a career in the family business. They don't really want to have a job, but sometimes they're afraid to tell dad that that's what they want to do. And I think that that is another opportunity. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reality because they believe that they will be disinherited if they say that. Uh, because they would rather do you know teaching or whatever nursing or whatever they want to do but they stay within the family business because they think that they will lose out on the legacy but so there is an issue we need to address that and that can be addressed by assets without the company and within the company and shareholding which salvo can talk about but but i think that um it's a matter of everybody pulling together and not and being happy to s work with each other rather than looking for preeminence and that at that stage in survival stage do you want to add to that, Salva? What do you think? Uh, yes, and uh, once again, all your your mentioning and uh, the reasoning you're having uh, calls me back to a discussion we had a uh, few few months ago about, uh, in my in my opinion and experience, the first step for good succession is for the elder generation to prepare themselves himself or herself or the, the, the group at the, at the top of the of the business for succession because uh, thinking of uh, succession uh, in ownership and in management as a, a combination uh, of succession that needs to be prepared in a way that works for the future of the business and of the family is a responsibility of the current generation uh, in front of the business and all its stakeholders, including obviously uh, the family as a group and as individual members. And is, uh, what is your experience in this respect? I mean, how much do you see that uh, those who have to pass the bed on to the next generation are really prepared for that step? Well, <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember when I, when I say prepared, I don't only say emotionally prepared, but no, I say but... they are competent in doing that job. Yes. Now, I, as I said to you, I've never really called a succession program a succession program. We've called it a growth program or whatever. But um, I've fallen out with both generations. That's the job of actually facilitating succession in the sense that um, they're, they're sometimes leaders of family businesses are not prepared to let go. So if we say that we've got a lot of potential young people coming up in the next generation, I think it's a great opportunity to delegate some tasks. Now, I always say that we should delegate 15% of the tasks to start with, right? So, um, and I've also said that in, in to do a, a program like this, you need to create 15% of time. And they will always say, throw their hands up in horror and say that we, we're so busy, we can't do that. But if we measure the amount of time we've, wait, we've wasted in meetings that don't go anywhere, we've got the 15%. So I think that the first thing is that the leader has to accept the responsibility of letting go to some of the tasks. I mean, if you say a leader's working 100% of the time, she or he can say, well, okay, I can delegate these things. Let me delegate, start delegating some, some tasks and supporting people to do them and then start delegating more tasks. And the danger is about leadership that we spend a lot of time focusing on, focusing on operational issues when we should be thinking about strategic issues, about the future. That's the job of leadership. Operational things should be done by managers and by bringing on successors. The second thing is about if the owner is prepared to delegate, the second thing is, as you say, it's about the, the competency of the potential successors to accept responsibility and to do it. Now, I think if you create a framework, I, I'm looking at, to me, succession is based on creating structure so that people have every chance of success, including governance. So that if they say, are you, I always say to a person, are you prepared to take on this task? I don't give it to them. I say, are you prepared to take it on? Yeah, okay. When do, you, when do you think we can do it by, you know, and give them the deadline they agree to. And then we discuss on how we're going to do it and do everything we can to help them succeed. So I don't think you would just delegate a job and let it get on with it. I think you delegate it and help them to succeed. And But by the way, delegation isn't about giving a job and telling them how to do it. It's about giving a job and telling them what you want to achieve at the end. And they come back to you with how they're going to do it that's proper delegation because they've got a chance to contribute their ideas. So there is the two, there are the two sides, the, um, the older generation prepared to let go and the younger generation prepared to accept responsibility. And I've had discussions, very frank discussions with owners who won't let go and even franker discussions with successors who are not prepared to put in the effort and the time to actually deliver what they should be, they promised to do. Uh, I remember once in a, in, a, in a program in Cardiff where we had 60 speakers, 60 people in the audience discussing the succession. And I nominated this guy who had called me a very rude name a couple of weeks before. And he put his arm around my shoulder and called me his friend. And I thought, well, I thought he, I was his enemy. But we, we have to have straight talking. And the, the worst thing you can do in succession, I think, is to talk behind people's back. You need to talk and tell, it, tell them frankly. and take criticism as well as give it you know it's a two-way street leadership is not leadership can be lonely so i'm hoping that with the structure it isn't so lonely yes and this is really important but there is also another point that is uh, in my opinion raised by uh, arnaud's question which is uh, how do you prepare the transfer of ownership, of ownership, not, not of leadership in, in the business. How do you prepare the transfer of ownership in a way that creates sustainable conditions for the business operations? Because it, whereas uh, eventually in, uh, uh, in very large list of companies where you, in theory, do not have uh, a dominating uh, number of shareholders or things like that. You can think that uh, management is really, sometimes it happens so that the management is handling the business independent in somehow for what shareholders think. 
in the case of a family business, uh, it is more and more common that shares are, uh, are, tr are transferred to multiple family members. And uh, this is a relatively new, uh, meaning that until a very few decades ago, uh, there was uh, uh, very frequently the use of uh, uh, giving the shares to one single inheritor or to very reduce the number of inheritors. Nowadays, it is more and more common that parents prefer to uh, offer shares to multiple family members. So in, in very few generations, you reach a, an impressive number of, of shareholders. And balancing in somehow what you do in respect to leadership and want to do in respect to uh, competent and responsible shareholdership for patient shareholders, not only for those who are active in the business, uh, is in my opinion also a very important task uh, of, uh, of the current generation. I, I, I'm, if anybody wants to other, contribute things, that's absolutely great. But I'm alluding to a, a seminar we did in Belfast some years ago, which was entitled, Don't Give It to the Children, which was to a packed audience, I hasten to add. Um, and, <clears throat> The, the speakers, including myself, but the other speakers were talking about larger companies <clears throat> that had survived multiple generations by um, very lucky and timely deaths. Because there is an issue here about when we say don't give it to the children, I don't mean do not give it to children. But the question is, um, first of all, what do we want to give the children? I mean, I, we, we discussed in the past, you and I, about, I remember being uh, asked to attend a meeting uh, for this family and they were discussing succession. And the, this was a very successful bakery business, incidentally. Um, turned over something like 18 million sterling a year. And the father met me just before Christmas and said, I decided that I need to look at succession. My idea is to give my property assets to my son because he doesn't like to work hard and he doesn't like the business. And I'll give the business to my daughter because she's competent and works hard. Well, I just said, that's great, except that the financial assets for the property are easy money. You know, you've just got to sit there and the money rolls in, whereas the business could go either way. So perhaps we need to discuss that and discuss proper succession planning. Um, after Christmas, he, he promised to ring me just after Christmas, he didn't. Um, in actual fact, I rang them mid-January and he sadly died over Christmas. And then you had legal discussions. But I think I've had another situation and I'm rehearsing this. I'm not saying the, I met a, um, an owner of a business, a very nice guy actually, and he's got five kids and he wanted to give 20% to each child, which sounds great. Sounds fair, doesn't it? Um, but is it the right thing for the business? Because I said to him, how many are employed in the business? Three. How many of them are competent to lead the business in the future? One and a half. And so the, 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 the issue to my mind is to look at the ownership. Now in larger companies, we can, have, we can have, you've talked about good governance structures which can resolve a lot of these issues. But in smaller family businesses, we've got to look at the fact uh, that if, for instance, let's take a simple situation of um, this five shares, you would uh, have perhaps the manager of the leading managing director of the company working 70 to 80 hours a week and being paid a salary, but not an excessive salary, and then sharing the dividends equally with the others who are not contributing. So it creates a perverse incentive not to work hard. So I think this area of ownership for the next generation can be resolved sometimes by having assets that are outside the business and sharing the assets out. But it's like in the situation of a farm where a farm has to be inherited, we have to look at um, the right people and for the right job with the right responsibility and the right governance structure. Has anybody else got any things they'd like to add to that from the audience? Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking about um, passing on the business. The way I am second generation and the way I, I see it is not, it's like so, um, the- Can you turn your camera on, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. So 
Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you for having me. Um, so there are two possibilities which which, which uh, could happen in, in, in passing on uh, the baton as, as you mentioned so one of them would be uh, the the first generation saying to the second generation okay um, enter enter this vehicle go into the the, uh, the driving position and go the the other one which would be a little bit more clever is okay you sit on the front i'm going to give you the steering wheel and the controls i'm going to sit on the back seat and i'm going to watch you for a while, I'm going to mentor you. If you need to turn left, I'll tell you to turn left. If you need to turn right, I'll tell you I'll tell you to turn right. At one point, after a number of these sessions, I'm going to exit the vehicle. I'm going to uh, follow you, uh, drive it from from a, a close distance. What I think happens sometimes is that the first generation or whatever generation is passing the baton wants to stay in the driver's seat and have the second generation always in the passenger seat. <laughs> if something happens to the driver, to the, to the generation passing the baton on, as uh, Peter just mentioned now, then it's a problem. Who's going to drive the, uh, the vehicle? If no one, I mean, not a car, let's say it's a helicopter, okay? So something a little bit more elaborate, because everyone can drive a car with over 18. But if you're, if you're, if the, the father or the, or the, or whoever is driving the helicopter and is showing the son or the daughter. Listen, this you, you press the right lever, the left lever, and then uh, throttle, etc. That's one thing. If you give him the controls, that's another. Give him the controls, but but uh, by staying there in the other seat, not in the driving seat. Otherwise, problems might arise. Just as uh, Peter said right now, the, the 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 founder of the company passed away over the Christmas period. So so um, maybe. His baking secrets were not already um, were not passed on properly, so who's going to do the, the the special cakes now? Mm -hmm. So there is a attention to be paid here. I, I hope I can do the same with my children, and guide them from the back seat, and tap them on the on the shoulder from the if it's left turn left. I'll tap you on the right shoulder if it's turn right. I will allow you to do some mistakes, the calculated ones, because otherwise you won't learn. Yeah. Okay, so maybe park on a pavement or, or right in front of a door, but then I'll correct you later. But you have to drive. Thank you. I, I think that's lovely. I think that what Keith talks about the pilot, particularly the holy helicopter, because there's a story in, um, in Wales where I come from of two helicopter crashes actually. Um, one, uh, both were fatal. Uh, in one case, the the family business had created a succession program in place and the business is still here. And the other one, the business failed because there were no pilots to take over. And I, and I think that the analogy of the helicopter is quite you know, good really, because it's, it's a very complex thing to run. Um, the backseat driving is an interesting vision for me as well. But, but I think it's, it's, a, it's how do you set your children up to succeed? And I think you're right. I think if you can share the responsibility and let them and i think the big thing you said let them make mistakes because mistakes are under, much underestimated we learn a lot from our mistakes as long as they're not too serious then you know we've learned a lot i think that's good actually yeah yeah i i completely agree on this and uh, uh, i think that if you don't let your successors make make mistake the moment will come that they will make the father mistake. And uh, it is important in this process of growing successors to allow them to make mistake uh, that create consequences, but the consequences are not fatal so that they can have the opportunity to experience from their mistakes. Because uh, one attitude sometimes uh, I, I see in, in family businesses is that uh, the family doesn't create conditions uh, that uh, allow young people to make mistakes. And uh, so they don't learn. But there is also another attitude that can be eventually be even more dangerous, which is uh, don't making them uh, pay for the consequences of their mistake. Mm -hmm. 
Because when you don't pay for the consequences of your mistake in somehow, uh, you do not realize that mistakes have consequences. Uh, and you have what one of my professors in my PhD program called uh, uh, negative learning. I mean, you learn from negative experiences, but you get satisfaction from the experience. So your brain uh, operates this in a way that considers it being positive. And, and this is awful because this destroys the capacity of people to, to make proper judgments. So uh, I completely agree that the process of uh, growing successors uh, has to go like that. At the same time, escaping from one, um, another possible mistake that, um, let's say, a company from the back can create that uh, especially in times when things change at this fast rate as we are experiencing, uh, sometimes the other generation do not have the proper view uh, of the future. So it is really important to have a combination of perspective. I mean, combining uh, the experience of the elder generation with the gradient of the present world uh, in, uh, in, in, in being different from uh, only a few decades ago. I mean, I, I can see this for even from my experience uh, in, in the university. Uh, when I started teaching in my university every 10 years, we more or less told, oh, these students are different from the previous ones. And then uh, this kind of thinking happened in five years. And now every two years, you see students with completely different attitudes, a way of learning, way of uh, experiencing about classes or uh, looking for sources for learning, etc. And it's very important to be adapted to these uh, different environment in which uh, new generations uh, live. Uh, let's see whether there are other other comments. Not seems doesn't seem to me. Is there anyone else who wants to intervene from the audience? Sharing uh, your experience or your reflections or, or eventually disagreements. They are more than welcome. We had a question last week, which is from uh, Phaedra. I think, I, um, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. It says, uh, what criteria would you have for selecting a, a good uh, CEO, a helicopter overview? Um, you know, unless the person is cho just chosen by age or what other criteria would you use? So, or maybe we've got other questions coming up. Yeah. Uh, shall I? Go through the comments that we received from the beginning so you can. Uh, yes, sure. Yes. Thank you, Naya. You can say whether we have covered them or not. I think we've covered uh, the issue of nepotism. I think Peter has talked about this before. Uh, we have a comment from Pedra saying that fair judgment and treatment is key, where prejudice and wrong perceptions about a person's goodwill while trying to build a culture of trust, alignment, and communication does not prevail. Um, do you, would you like to comment further on this? Okay, this is the question from last week we're talking about, I guess, is it? No, 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 no it's from no, now. If you go to the, the chat. Yes. Yeah. All right, okay. Well, I mean, the, 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 the issue to my mind is, uh, uh, I've talked about the meritocracy, but I've also talked about, there is an issue about um, poor alignment. Uh, but what do I mean by that? Well, the strategy is here and the way we measure performance is here. And over here is the appraisal system and over here is the reward system. So all of these are out of alignment. And as a result, people are confused what's expected of them. So I think that if you create the right structures for growth and succession, then people know what's expected of them and, and, they, and they should behave accordingly, actually. And I think that the, the point about what Salvo says about um, making mistakes and negative learning, I think that people need to own up to their mistakes. I mean, we always stop learning. We always make mistakes. I say on my LinkedIn thing, that's what I've been doing is making mistakes. And I think that... Um, 
that will that will if they've got dysfunctional behaviors which is what we said last time is um then those will come out and they will be washed out in the process that we've we've created i hope what do you think so i i totally agree and uh, obviously uh creating conditions that make people think they are judged fairly on on dimensions that are pre-known and understood uh, and connected to the relevance of the job they have to do etc it's all important to create that culture of trust alignment and communication and uh, prejudice exists in family business uh, prejudice exists in families Prejudice is sometimes even multi-generational, meaning that in my experience, I have experienced it. The consequences of some prejudice in a family uh, re-emerging after three generations with some uh, unexplicable behavior until the moment you understood that three generations before, one member of that branch of the family had done, had, had certain behavior that damaged one member of the other branch of the family so that from then on those branches had uh, relational problems and they didn't trust each other. But in those cases, it is important that somehow family members try to uh, reset the environment and say, well, the past is the past. We need to find a way uh, for the future and we need uh, to rebuild our relationship. It's good, you know, it's important to understand that you have to recover in somehow on certain uh, past issues, but you need to have a shared will of overcoming those kinds of, of prejudice uh, and, uh, and uh, start behaving fairly and judging facts instead of judging uh, on based on prejudice, in my opinion. I think that's very true. And I, I, on that basis, which is judging fairly and transparently, uh, we've had, it's, it's very, even in this day and age, sometimes daughters are not considered as potential leaders of businesses, which I find very, very sad. But once we've given the meritocracy and we, the transparency of openship, it's obvious that there are certain people who should be in certain positions. And I think that's really good. Have we, I can't see any other questions coming up. Have we got any uh, other questions? Yes, we do. But I also see a hand raised from Ricardo. Oh, uh, right. Ricardo, okay. should you want to speak? Thank you, Ricardo. Yes, good evening, everyone. And thank you for this valuable session and the rich information we received. I want to confirm everything that has been said within our family. We went through the uh, writing our constitution uh, three years ago. Uh, we are currently uh, five shareholders, very close, two parents and three children, aligned on everything. And we've been uh, discussing the points in our family constitution for the past 25 years, but we've never managed to put them on paper. We had the courage three years ago to have a consultant on board who forced us to say out loud and write and sign after every session, everything we decided. And uh, since that day, our lives have changed because we know we agree, but when we discussed them around the table, we figured that there were many disagreements and we thought that we had agreed upon. Uh, some topics like uh, uh, in-laws joining the business uh, or uh, children having secured position took sometimes five or six days of discussion to, uh, to, to reach a, a consensus. So uh, one, we, we, we finished uh, the, the, the first draft uh, in July 2019 and it was a life changer for us. Now everybody, all, everything that has been mentioned during this session, I'm happy that it was taken into consideration in our family constitution. And uh, we have set an age limit of 65 for exiting the business, so unconditional. We can keep the, uh, uh, the uh, leading generation as consultants, but they have to leave the leadership uh, and, and pass over. 
We have also taken into consideration the mentoring process of the next trends. So there is the, uh, uh, it has been discussed earlier that uh, some families recommend work outside the family business, which we have adopted. Uh, but also there is a mentoring process within the family business so that they understand the business and they really uh, decide to join the business by choice and not by force. So uh, during their, uh, uh, it's a 20 year long process because we start very early in our family, starting the age of six, we start involving them in, in the family uh, uh, enterprise. And uh, uh, if they choose that they don't find themselves within the company as, as uh, uh, working uh, and uh, having positions in the company, they need to be responsible owners. So uh, in, in both cases, uh, it serves. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that putting all this in a family constitution, and I discovered after 25 years of complexity in my head, thinking that the family constitution was like a country's constitution, that it could be a simple one pager or maybe a few sentences that will make your life much easier. And since that date, we review it on a yearly basis. We sit all of us together, all the concerned. We review it and we, if we feel that we need to modify something, we never, we did not have to yet, uh, it, there's always possibility to, to adapt and change. But it keeps us aligned and uh, uh, of course uh, it uh, enforces the trust among us and makes it very clear for our spouses uh, or our next friends uh, what to expect and how to get ready to take uh, eventually the leadership of, of the companies. So, I, I think, that, I think Thank that's you excellent. very much, Ricardo, for sharing uh, your experience with this. I, I think very valuable. Peter, please. Well, uh, the only comment I, I, I thought what Ricardo said is, is profound. I think it's really good because when uh, Horst and I had a meeting in the Chamber of Commerce in Berlin, and it's true of other places that we have thousands of family leaders who are over 70, family business leaders over 75. And, and this is a real big issue. It's, it's a time bomb, a demographic time bomb. So I think if we have a constitution that says you retire at 65, then it creates a sense of urgency and responsibility for passing on to the next generation and bringing them on in the way that you've said the constitution does. But I think even that one point of saying you will retire at 65 is, a, is an important thing because quite frankly, then we realize that it is our privilege to pass on to the next generation before that happens or at that time. Absolutely. And there is also another interesting point you raised, which is uh, the fact that you, you think you agree, but until the moment you have to put in it in writing, you don't understand how much differences there are in the way you agree. And uh, putting it in right also helps you in, uh, uh, in aligning disagreements and in dealing properly with disagreements because you understand you want, you have a common goal uh, that sometimes you defer on how to reach the goal, but it obliges you on going through those issues. And another important word that you, uh, you used was to build consensus. Uh, because if, if the goal is building consensus, then uh, you understand it doesn't mean necessarily that you exit from the room with the same result you thought you were going to get when you entered the room. And this kind of attitude is very important in the process of dealing with the constitution and also revising the constitution periodically. And I, I like uh, at your stage, the fact that you revise it yearly makes you really consider your constitution as a live document, as something you have to own as the owning family and it has to be your document and not just uh, a piece of paper you put uh, in, uh, in your bookshelf and uh, your pride off. So it, it, it's a very, very nice experience. Thank you so much for sharing. I think it's very valuable. Can I, can I share something? Are there more? Can I share something? Yes, sure. You're welcome. First of all, congratulations. 
yeah. not only to you both, but also to the whole whole structure because we've learned a lot. And to be honest, I'm tra transcribing all the notes and sharing them with my four children so that they can benefit from these webinars. I, I, I didn't believe that there was so much good was going to come out of it. So congratulations to all Thank you. the organization. Thank you. I have a situation where, where at the moment I'm transcribing the family business charter. I have been through succession planning as regard the financial side because three or four children are in the business and one isn't, but he has seen property. We have an operation business where we run a beauty wholesale business and a school and also property companies, two property companies. So we divested the beauty business from the properties so that the three children who are working in it will inherit that company, you see, whereas the four children will inherit the properties. So at the moment, with the government incentives for saving on succession tax, we are transferring the, all the shares to our children because we, in some of companies, they have a share, the others, they don't. So we're transferring either the remaining shares or all the shares in the businesses. But because we are uh, advanced in our age, you know, and we don't want to end up um, in a bad retirement, uncomfortable one, but we want to protect our retirement. That's what our audit has been saying to us, that we don't want to end up in a, you know, in a cheap home where you suffer after, after spending 50 years of Absolutely. working and well, 40 years now business building it up together from scratch, you know? So we have, we have what we're doing now is the process to, to, we are passing all the shares, but retaining the usufruct so that we don't end up penniless it's because we have experience of people who transferred to their children, they threw them out and they had to, to remain on the seat like beggars. But in this respect, some decision making is, is not passed over, you see, with the usufruct so that they can just sell the properties because we have a user fraud. So that means we have a say, but we are not, as far as the operation company is concerned, we're not, we're not, we are taking a back seat so that we are there watching them and suggest we only interfere, we are all involved when it comes to major decisions. And we're holding now some board meetings, not so, not so often, so that we can trash out certain, uh, like, like this project we're working on the, on the family business charter. So how do you look at the at us? That means, we're giving away, but not giving all, you see, but we're retaining certain rights because if we release those rights, then we can be penniless. You know, we don't want to, for example, sell, then they sell properties and we end up living in a garage. So, so but we are retaining mm. some, not some, but it's a very powerful tool, you know, because but we have a by law that when you have use of rock, the children can just decide to, dis to change or even change even the M&A because otherwise we change an A because we're not being a shareholder. They can't just sit down and vote and <laughs> they throw us out being the old parents. So how do you look at this process? And I'm, I'm, what I'm doing also, final point, I'm, a, I'm entrenching very interesting points that I've learned from these seminars into the business charter. So, so that there will be like um, strategies or uh, the structure or what the children should look for. We're also also in, always invested for our grandchildren from birth with a baby plan so that when they reach 18, you see, they have a sum of money reserved so that in the case they want to, they want to process further their studies and the business whatever they want, they can draw because they don't find the money. And we also started recently now a monthly subscription where we invest some money into each of our seven grandchildren's account so that in the future, when they need some money to study or to expand the business, then there's be some funds, you see. But this is, this is, a, this is a suggestion. But how do you look at the usufruct matter where we are giving and not giving at all, you see? Peter? Well, I, 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 we've got Panikos and we've got Rania who might want to comment as well. but I. I mean, there's an issue here. First of all, Joe, would you like to adopt me? Because if you're going to be uh, giving largesse to everybody, I'm a worthy cause. But but the the, the thing about it is, to me, um, 
and I, it's not just about tax, you see, it's, it's about lots of things. That's why when we think about succession planning, and I, you've got to think about yourself, incidentally, I mean, we've met, uh, we've discussed this with owners, and they've virtually given their money away to who they care. And, you know, it's like writing a will, who do you love, what do you want to give them, and what will they benefit? So you've got to look after yourself as you have. And so it depends on the tax rules and the trust rules within uh, your jurisdiction, but you can have a life interest trust and so on, and you can have your constitution. But um, I'm concerned that you make sure that you, you are looked after yourself, but but also that, you know, you've, you've looked after everybody, but it's making sure, and I don't know the details of this, nor the tax uh, regime in your area, but it's, there's more than things than just tax avoidance. It's a matter of looking after your future and the future of the business. But is there anybody else who would like to contribute to that, like Panikos or Rania or somebody? Panikos, I think out, welcome, of, respect, Rania, welcome to you out of respect, Salvadore to comment first, just in case the University of Palermo will welcome an endowment, and then I can call it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think that the idea of uh, retaining fruits uh, and uh, passing uh, bare ownership when you're in life and to secure yourself for a proper standard of life uh, in, in, the, uh, in the last years of your life is, uh, is, a, is a good attitude. I mean, it, it helps uh, you in, in two respects. First of all, is it gives you a uh, right to receive from, uh, from what you have built or what you have raised, uh, if it came from a previous generation. Uh, keep the fruits of this, as you were mentioning, not having uh, a poor life uh, after spending your entire life in building uh, the, the family's uh, fortune somehow. And at the same time, it gives uh, uh, frequently in many, in many countries uh, some uh, tax advantage because you transfer their ownership we see, which is cheaper in terms of taxation than transferring uh, the entire ownership plus fluids. And when they join in most, uh, in most uh, legislations, you are not going to pay extra taxes because they just rejoin, uh, the, the fluids just rejoin to the bare ownership. So it's important. And what I think is that it is very important in a case like the one you're mentioning that you, invite your family members from the next generation to make their own choices about how do they think uh, and they can make it when you are in life and you can uh, uh, support their way of thinking, etc. But it, it's, it, it's useful that in the family you start a discussion on what, what do we think about the future structure of the relationship between the family and the business. Well, how do we consider wealth? How do we consider having a joint wealth or do we prefer going for individual wealth? And you can make uh, both things because you can build uh, individual wealth and then manage it in a joint uh, way to take benefits and gaining, uh, how to say, size advantage by establishing, for instance, a family office. So each one has their own assets, its or her own assets, but they are managed by a family office that facilitates managing the, 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 the family's uh, assets. Or you can go the opposite way. You can decide that uh, you have a joint uh, wealth as a family, or you can make combinations of those. Some assets are individual, uh, some part of the portfolio is individually owned and some part of the portfolio is uh, shared by, by all family members. And having a strategy in this respect is very important when you get to multi-generational families, because it also balances eventually what Peter was mentioning before about uh, 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 not having uh, all the eggs in one single basket and giving people the opportunity to eventually make exchange of certain assets. I'm not interested in the business, so I will receive more of a certain asset uh, and I will leave the business to those who are more interested or things like this. So I, I sincerely think that uh, it is a sort of responsibility of, 
of the generations who are managing the, the, the family assets to raise those assets in a balanced way uh, accordingly with what there was one question about unbalanced growth of the business in respect to the family, and this is the case. Uh, Panikos or Rania, Rania too has a lot of questions. Question. Uh, I, I will um, answer after I ask a couple of questions because I detect, uh, Joe, that you're talking about brothers in business because you refer to your children. So I don't know how many cousins we are talking, how many are active, how many are passive. So, uh, and the, the most important thing is, uh, where is your jurisdiction? Are you in, uh, in, in Europe or if you're in the UK, you know, the so-called uh, trust, it's an interesting vehicle to skip uh, taxation uh, and uh, also, uh, don't think just about your children. How about your grandchildren? So wealth and continuity planning, you know, has to be considered. Uh, it's 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 becoming more complex, of course. If you're talking about different family units, so the way you will split does impact. But again, I want to see the family tree. And I want to see your legal jurisdiction to be in a position. And then, you know, the businesses, are they separate? Are they associated companies? Uh, is there a holding there? Is there a scope for the holding? This will facilitate what we call multidimensional uh, continuity planning that will also address, you know, succession from the ownership side and retirement and uh, ensure that there are also exit valves. What happens if these children are not the highly committed that will continue the, the, the business? So there are classes of shares that you can give them equity, but you don't give them the voting power until they prove themselves. So that's all for me. Over to Rania to uh, give also the French and the civil law, as we say, because I represent the common law. I have a British passport. You may detect I have a strong Cypriot accent. Good evening. Can I have another question? Thank you, Panikos. Uh, Rania. Uh, another question, Salvatore. My, my, my question is that we want to pass the business to our children and to grandchildren. Now, they're already at an old age of going to university, you know, and one is in architecture, one is in interior design, one is in chemistry, none of them. So how can I, how can we have my children attract, we have seven grandchildren, how can, can they attract them to the business if they are taking different lines of professionalism in their career, in the career path? Because otherwise, I can't not, not continue, you know. <laughs> this is my, if, if they, the grandchildren, who will carry on the business? If the grandchildren take on different professions than what my other children have taken, taken up, you see? So it will collapse. And that's a difficult question, you know, because you talk about the future. But there is scope for professional management until uh, you discover that in-laws can do a better job than your line you know, given your, uh, you know, the orientations of the next generation. There are a lot of options there, but we need to collect more information to be in a position to, you know, make um, an evaluation of the options. Over to uh, Rania, please. Yes, uh, well, in line with what you just said, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. My connection is on. Yeah. I, I will turn off my video. Maybe the, the sound will be better. I, I was just saying that it is, um, it is important to raise responsible owners. 
is we don't have uh, the possibility to have those generation members join the business. The responsible ownership is key. It has been highlighted earlier today. And this can be done by educating the next generation members and by helping them play a, a responsible role when they vote. So they vote you know, decisions which are in line with a long-term view of the business. Uh, they, are, they are also you know, meant to make decisions around dividends, which are thoughtful, you know, rather than use the long term. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's really a matter of educating uh, the next generation and also um, letting them know that family harmony is one of the main objectives of the family business. So it's not just about managing the business, but also about managing the family. And, uh, and you know, as the Panico said also, you know, if you don't have uh, family members who are able to join the business in effective roles, then the in-laws can be an option or non-family you know, non members. Um, and I recall there was a question earlier about the criteria that we should keep in mind when hiring external directors or managers. And I think one of them is the compatibility of the values between the family and the business. So let's keep in mind, you know, Sorry, Rania, we lose your voice. Salvo, if I may interrupt now, because we only have five minutes left. Yes. I want yes, to share yes. with you one short question that was posted twice. If you can please respond to it in a minute, Max, and then yes. you, you can uh, finalize with our next activity. So the question yes. is from uh, Petra May, I think. She's asking, do you think that succession can be successfully managed internally or is external expertise essential? <laughs> it depends on a lot of things in my opinion, uh, because it depends on, on your expertise as a, or your family expertise in dealing with succession. Uh, obviously, you, if you have enough expertise to deal with uh, the topic you can handle is it by your own, but at the same time, you have to be, uh, I would say, you have to be prepared to some emotional issues that can be easier to be uh, dealt with by external uh, professionals that can facilitate uh, in respect to some uh, emotional uh, uh, questions. So I think that you don't need to rely on external, not necessarily need to rely on external support. Obviously, you need to assess uh, the family's overall preparation for uh, having uh, the process by their own. I mean, I, I know multi-generational families that have done this exercise uh, already two or three times, and they are very well prepared to handle most of the process by their own. Even though in some cases they call, uh, uh, they invite some uh, uh, professional uh, for one session just to receive some external voice or things like that. But it is different than asking um, one professional to coach your process. If it is the first time you are going through a process like this, I think that uh, having an external support can facilitate an, um, in a number of issues. Uh, so I, I hope I gave uh, an acceptable answer to a very complex, uh, sincerely, uh, topic. And uh, we have to go to closure. Uh, so uh, I want to repeat, as I did in the, in, at the beginning, uh, the, the, the announcement for our shared learning network. Uh, we will offer a, a shared learning web or network uh, using uh, our newly designed family business succession planning handbook. It will be for 10 participants to design their own succession plans for their family business. Uh, should more people have attention, uh, interest in the process, so we could try to establish uh, two rooms, for instance, because uh, having a, a, a handball 
uh, interactive group is very important in an activity like this. The program is uh, over three two hour Zoom sessions. So it will be like six hours overall. And uh, if uh, any of you is interested in participating, uh, you can email our program administrator, who is Naya, at uh, the uh, email address you see there, naya at grantexpert.eu. Naya, you have uh, any additional advice or information to share? No, I think you've covered uh, the announcement about the Share Learning Networking events uh, pretty well. Of course, any more details that will be decided in the coming days can be forwarded to everybody who registered for these webinars via email. So you'll receive another email from me regarding these events. Um, Thank you so much. And uh, other than that, I want to share uh, to thank everybody again for joining uh, since the since the middle of January until the beginning of March uh, our webinars and for hanging out with us every Tuesday evening. Uh, we greatly appreciate it and I think this series has been a big success. So thank you all again. Any other words from you, Salvo or Peter? Thank you, Naya. Thank you, thank you, Peter you. and uh, and uh, Rania and Panikos and all those who intervened uh, in these and in the previous sessions. Uh, as the project coordinator, I'm really uh, proud of being part of these uh, uh, of, of this team, and I'm really happy of the collective job we have done uh, up to date. We wait for uh, your expression of interest uh, to Naya's address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ciao. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.